Praise the Lord. Father, we thank you for our Bible study tonight. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your hands upon our lives. Thank you for keeping us alive and healthy so that everything within, without, around, personally and our families, everything under our control will be handed over to you to serve and to worship you unreservedly in Jesus' name. We come to the study of your word tonight again and we're asking Lord that your word will penetrate every heart, purify every heart and attach us in full consecration unto you in Jesus name and that our lives and every detail will be for your glory. Everything we say, everything we do, everywhere we go, everything will be to the glory of your name in Jesus name. Bless us, Lord, tonight and give us understanding in your word. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. And everybody will say good, good, amen. amen. God bless you. Consider we're coming to Daniel, Daniel chapter 3. And we're studying tonight from verse 1 to verse 18. Please open your Bible. Daniel chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, whose height has, uh, was uh, three score cubits, and the breadth thereof six cubits. And he set it up in the plain of Dura, in the province of Babylon. And then in verse 2, it tells us, it says, Then Nebuchadnezzar the king said to gather together the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, and the counselors, the sheriffs, the, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And then we're told in verse 3, in verse 3 it says, Then the princes and the governors and the captains and the judges and the treasurers, the counselors and the sheriffs and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Come to verse 13. In verse 13 we're told that Nebuchadnezzar was in rage. Then Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought those men, they brought these men before the king. In verse 14, in verse 14 it says, Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up. Verse 15. Verse 15 says, Now, if ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, harp, sabbat, satri, and dulcima, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image that I have made well. But if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour. There will be no trial, there will be no delay. You will be cast the same hour into the midst of the burning furry furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Verse 16, verse 16, tell us she that Meshach and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we're not careful, we're not anxious, we're not calculating to answer thee in this matter. Verse 17, if it be so, 
our God, when we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fairy furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. Verse 18 now. In verse 18, but if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Obviously, you've heard the story before. Obviously, you've learned quite a lot from this portion of the Bible before. But today, the Lord is reminding us what we need to do how we need to set our mind, how we need to focus our attention on God and God alone. That as we come into the kingdom, as we know him, as we reconciled unto God, and as we have the goodness of the grace of God bringing salvation, bringing redemption, bringing righteousness into our lives, that tests will come. Trials will come, temptations will come, there will be solicitation to evil. But then we declare our stand. Already as we are born again and we are coming to the kingdom of God, we are consecrated to God. We are committed to God and we have opened our mouth that him and him alone will we serve. And now the test will come to try us and to test what we have said, whether we will or we will not. And here come Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, standing for the truth and standing for their commitment. If they knew the New Testament, what they didn't know, they would say they will earnestly, whatever happens, Whatever does not happen, whatever the threat, whatever the trial, whatever the temptation, they will earnestly, wholeheartedly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Now we have the word, the whole word. He has revealed his mind to us. And now that we come into the kingdom, and the tears will come, the trial will come, and the threats will come. We should be able, by the grace of God, in the strength of the Lord, by the Spirit of the Lord, to earnestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints and manifest the courage, manifest the conviction on that track. That's what we're looking at this passage tonight. And we're looking at three points at this. Uh, at uh, the topic, manifesting courage with conviction on the trial. It has to be a personal courage, an experiential courage, something that we got from the Lord and nothing can take away from us on the basis of our salvation. On the basis of the approaching of the Adamic nature, that we have sanctification experience, he has purified us, and we love him, and we fear him, and we're committed to him in everything and at all times. We have that personal conviction, and the conviction brings courage in our lives, and it's not a hidden thing. At the time of personal devotion, personal prayer, family prayer, I will say we're committed to the Lord. But it comes out when you get to the marketplace and when you get to the public and the public in their principles in their practices they challenge you and that is the time you manifest the courage it's not when you are isolated when you are alone when nobody is challenging you but when the challenge is there when the difficulties are there when the things that confront you and want to take the faith and the conviction away from you that's the time you manifest the courage with conviction under those trials three points we're looking at today as we consider this number one contrast between god's commandment and the king's demand the lord had given the command that should not worship any other god before me and now the man, the king, the emperor, he has raised up an idol, an image in contradistinction, contrary to the commandment of the Lord. The contrast between God's commandment and the king's demand. Number two is the coercion of godly companions through the king's domination. He said, no. They were his um, citizens now. 
They have been brought to Babylon. He had even given them some level of education. He has given them work to do and he has provided for them. He must not only dominate the secular, he must not only dominate their profession, he must dominate their heart, their mind, their spirit, their soul, and dominate and determine their destiny. He said, you are here in Babylon and you don't have any decision of your own. You don't have any liberty of your own. I determine how you live, who you worship, and I determine where you spend eternity. That's where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego drew the line. They said, no, it will not be. We might walk here we might make our living here, but our eternity will not be in your hand. Our destiny will not be in your hand. They drew the line, even though there was coercion. They wanted to force them, and they wanted to kind of coerce them into worshiping, contrary to the law of God. They drew the line. The, line, the time comes in your life when you have to draw the line. When anything touches your eternity when anything touches the destiny of your soul when anything whatever it is or not when it comes to the point they want to decide for you that you'll go with them to hell that's when you draw the line whatever the pressure whatever the pain whatever the suffering and whatever the consequence of what they try to do you see here i draw the line you will not pass over that line to take my soul to hell coercion of godly companions through the king's domination number three is the comportment and the gracious composture despite the king's deadliness that man was deadly that man said if you refuse to worship my golden image and i've decided already and there is no argument there is no kind of uh, you know discussion about this it's either you do or you don't do if you worship that's all right i release you if you don't i'll throw you into the furnace of fire and tell me shedak meshaka benigo who is that God that can deliver you out of my hand? They were calm, they were cool, they were well composed. They just said, go ahead and do what you want to do. And we will go ahead and do what we want to do. We will not do what we don't want to do. Because what you are telling us to do will lead us to hell fire. We will not do that. We are not going to get to hell on your behalf. That's for eternity. You can build your fire here. You can burn anything here. You can build the furnace here. But we will stand. And that's the commitment and the conviction that a child of God ought to have. That you hold everything, even life, you hold it with a loose hand so that nobody will say, this is what you love. This is what you like. This is what you cannot do without. And since you cannot do without this, then the aim at that thing to pull you and pull you to hell. We are going to heaven. You are going to heaven. And nobody will take heaven from you and then replace it with hell because of their threats and because the coercion and the punishment they threaten you with. Uh, look at number one here. Number one is the contrast between God's commandment and the king's demand. You know that already. God has commanded that will not worship idol but uh, nebuchadnezzar decided he was going to go contrary to god if anybody is going to go contrary to god it's not going to use me it's not going to use you to fulfill his aim and to fulfill his goal look at three things here number one number one we're looking at great transgressions after a great testimony number two great threats from a great 
tyrant. And number three, great trials with a great triumph. Look at number one. Number one is great transgressions after a great testimony. What does that mean? This man that set up an image of gold, this man that wanted himself and everybody to worship the idol, this man that threatened and said, if you don't worship the idol, the image of gold that I set up, setting himself up above God, against God. This man, look at the testimony he had given before this time, Daniel chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 47. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 47, Seven, the king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth, it is that your God is a God of gods and Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets, seeing thou couldest reveal the secret. You know the story, we've studied it before. He had a dream, he had forgotten the dream, and he threatened he was going to kill all his wise men and the Chaldeans if they don't recover the dream. And if they don't interpret the dream to him, none of those Chaldeans in Babylon, none of those wise men in Babylon could recover the dream. But Daniel said, give me time and I will get the dream back for you. And one night, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego prayed, and the Lord revealed unto them. And they came to the king and said, This is the dream. All the details of the dream, even the thoughts before the dream, everything that had happened to him during the day and now in the night, they revealed everything by divine revelation. And so Nebuchadnezzar himself said unto Daniel, and he said, Of a truth, there's no shadow of doubt about this that your God is a God of gods and a Lord of laws and a revealer of secrets seeing thou couldest reveal the secret which no wise man in Babylon could reveal you could reveal that you are serving a great God the God of gods is the king and the Lord of the kings look at verse 48 in verse 48 then the king made Daniel a great man and gave him many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. Then verse 49, in verse 49 it said, Then Daniel requested, requested of the king that, and he said, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego over the affairs of the the province of Babylon, but Daniel sat in the kings, in the gate of the king. Look at his great testimony. Look at his great declaration. Look at what he had said about the God of heaven, the God of gods, and the Lord of kings. And look at the, the, the great testimony that he now voiced and, and publicized that everywhere. That this is my confession about the God of heaven. And yet the man was not converted. And we need to be very careful. We listen to somebody and he gives something like, you know, uh, uh, the God that works here, the wonders that he does. This is great. I've never seen anything like this before. And now they're looking for accommodation to come and stay in your house. And look at the testimony. Who will not accommodate somebody like this? Pray. And think through. It's not what people say, it's what's in their heart. The idolatry in the heart of Nebuchadnezzar from, you know, from his birth is being put there by tradition, it's been put there by the family, it's been put there by his own acceptance of the idolatry. Even as a king, he was an idol worshiper, and he had all these magicians. All those things have not gone away from his heart. And now with a great testimony, this is a great God, this is a mighty God, this is a revealer of secret. There's no God like your God. That does not convert anyone. Look at Titus chapter 1, and I'm reading from verse 16. Titus 1 verse 16, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny him. 
in their behavior they deny him in their character they deny him in their secret pri uh, private policies and practices they deny him when they come to the place of worship and they are with the people of God and then they give this uh, flamboyant and great testimonies and their utterances they're like they're almost in heaven already but their hearts have not been changed their hearts have not been converted it's the conversion of the heart in the private recesses of the heart of the man of the woman of the boy of the girl that's what shows that we believe in god but look at this they profess that they know god but in works they deny him being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work think about that unto every good work every good work they are reprobates that's why you need to check up your own life too are you born again are you really converted is your heart chained or is it only the word that you speak in the public is it only the outward external manifestation or are you totally converted unto the lord we're told in mark chapter 7 in mark chapter 7 we're looking at verse 6 it says he answered and said unto them well as Isaiah's prophet said of you, hypocrites, Nebuchadnezzar was the biggest hypocrite in Babylon. And Jesus said, Isaiah's prophet said of you, hypocrites, as it is written, these people honoreth me with their lips. Honoreth me with their lips. God is the God of gods, and God is the Lord of kings. And yet he said, but their heart is far from me. The heart has not been washed. The heart has not been cleansed. The heart has not been turned around and transformed. Even though they, you know, say that God is great and God is good and all that. Look at verse 21. In verse 21, for from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts adulteries fornications and murders in verse 22 verse 22 says and tears of covetousness wickedness deceit lasciviousness and evil eye blasphemy pride foolishness verse 23 it says all these evil things all the evil things coming out of the heart all the evil things that uh, Nebuchadnezzar manifested the bad language the blasphemous language, those are the things that come from within and they defile the man. So a person may seem to have a great testimony and yet is still committing terrible sins and great sins in his or personal life. Those people do not belong to God. They do not really believe in God, although they shout high. They believe in God. When the Lord shall come and the trumpet shall sound, and the real Christian, the saints of God, those who are converted, those who are consecrated, committed to the Lord, when they will go to heaven, all these uh, loud talkers, all these people that project a seed, the great, great believers, they'll be left behind and they will suffer eternal punishment with the idol worshippers in hellfire forever. Let's look at number two here. Number two here, we're looking at the great threats from a great tyrant. The great threats from a great tyrant. And there are people that think that they make themselves God and they feel that somebody else's life is in their hand and you say you might claim to be born again you are saved you are um, you know a bible reader and then you believe all those promises when i pass through the water it will not uh, drown me and when i pass through the fire it will not burn me but we will show you that you are higher and greater than the word of god you seem to be claiming the gift 
great threats and their tyrants, and they really mean to carry out what they have uttered that they're going to carry out. They want you to look up to them as your God. They want you to look up to them as the final authority. They say if you are going to live long, it doesn't depend on the word of God, it doesn't depend on how you live your life. If you're going to live a long life, it depends on him. It depends on her. And he issued a great threat. And if you don't know your God, if you have not been in fellowship with God, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you might uh, be threatened. If you think of life so much, and you think of the temporary life as very important, and you're not thinking of eternity, you're not thinking of what does God say? What will God do? And what can God do? Their threats will catch you. The tyrant will squeeze your life like they pluck the flower and squeeze the flower. But the Lord will give you understanding. And whatever they say and whatever they threaten, you will stand for the Lord in Jesus' name. In Daniel chapter 3, we're looking at verse 4. It said, Then and Herod cried aloud to you, it is commanded, O people and nations and languages. Look at verse 5. That at what time, any time, even if you're sleeping, wake up and worship Nebuchadnezzar's idol. At what time? Ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbub, satri, dulcima, and all kinds of music. Ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. Look at verse 6. In verse 6, and whoso falleth not down, whatever his status, Whosoever it is, for let not down. Whatever is position or power or connections, whoso for let not down and worship it, shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning, furry furnace. And then in verse 7, we're told, therefore, at that time when all the people, without exception, except these godly people, heard the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, satri, and all kinds of music, it says all the people, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar, the king, had set up. Nobody had a mind of his own. Nobody had a decision of his own. Nobody had a conviction of his own. Nobody had manifested, I learned this when I was young. I lunched this when I was at home. I lunched this when daddy and mommy sat me down and they read the word of God to me. They had no mind of their own, no conviction of their own. When the whole of society went, that's where everybody went. There are people like that today. They go to church on Sunday. They go to weekday meetings in their local church, in, in their fellowship, and they profess that the children of God, their believers, wait until a popular scene holds this hold the sway. Wait until the people of the world make an edit and they say, this is what everybody will do. That's when you will know whether anyone has conviction or not. But in the case of all these people, because of the great threat and the great tyrant behind it, this is what they we're looking at Acts chapter 4 and reading from verse 17. But that it spread no further among the people, let us strictly command, threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. You remember that Christ, our Savior, our Lord, had given his own disciples what they should do to preach the word and preach repentance in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Now, where they were to begin was where they threatened them. And they said they should speak henceforth from this hour 
from this day to no man in this name. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, and he called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. They wanted them to deny Jesus as the only foundation cornerstone of our salvation and to deny him as the Lord and master of their lives and not to teach anything in his name. If you are not going to teach what Christ has said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. What else are you going to teach? And then in verse 19, in verse 19, and Peter and John answered and said unto them, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. Verse 20, in verse 20 it says, For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. They took their stand, and the Lord will help you to take your stand everywhere in Jesus' name. When the market people want you to contribute money, if you're going to continue in that market, because they're going to worship idol, you must contribute your part. You must be able to take your stand and say, here is where we stand. Here is the word of God. We will not contribute to the worship of any idol. You want to get married and, uh, you know, the people, uh, you are marrying uh, the lady from, uh, you are a brother and you know her as a sister. And the parents are saying, we don't know church will not know bible what we know is their idol and they want you to worship idol and they want you to contribute something you know, as part of the dowry that they will give to their idol that's the time to take your stand but if you want marriage at all cost marriage even if you miss heaven even if you lose heaven i just want to get married you're going to be sucked in into their system and when you are working with somebody is the manager, director, employer, and he demands this is what I want. He says he's not a Christian, he's an idol worshiper, and anybody he gives work to, this is what they must do. And what they are calling you to do is contrary to the word of God. That's when you take your stand. That's when we know who is a believer, or who is not a believer. At such a time, I pray you will stand. I will stand. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, we're looking at verse 10. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10, But thou hast fully known my doctrine and manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, perseverance. We must be able to bear there is something to persevere in that the, the challenge that will come to you and they talk to you softly, and you say, no, I don't do that. I can't do that. I'm a believer. They report you to higher authorities. And the authority calls you. He has a panel already. Three of them there. And they say, Mr. So-and-so, Madam So-and-so, this is what we do here. This one was established before you came to work here. And so you must do this. Don't carry church here. When you go to your church, practice church. When you go to the place of work, be a dual person. Your part in the church, <laughs> do that over there. But when you come here, this is what you do. And it's contrary to the word of God. You will not deceive. You will not sign something that's not according to the will of God. And then they put the pressure. What do you do? You stand. Then one of them there will tell you, Madam, this one will cost you your job. She dropped me shack and Abednego knew. This will cost their life. And life is much, much greater than work, than employment. If we're Christians, we must have the doctrine of the word and the manner of life and the purpose and the faith and the long suffering and charity and perseverance. Your co workers will call you aside and say, Mr. So and so, we love you so much. We don't want these people to disengage you. 
we love you so much we want you to rather go to hell than keep to the word of God and get to heaven that's when you take your stand and you say I don't know any other thing my number one job my number one desire my number one manner of life is to get to heaven and then if you lose your life if you lose your work they might say we told you but you are going to get a better job I didn't say a good amen then Look at verse 11. In verse 11, persecutions. That's Paul. He says, you know my manner of life. You know my persecutions. You know my affliction, which came unto me at Antioch and at Iconium at Lystra. What persecutions I endured. We have to endure it. They will threaten and they will, they will lay whatever it is on us. They'll take some rights away from us, our rights. But it says I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Look at verse 12. In verse 12, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. All without exception Exception. It may begin very near you at home, and then it may go to the marketplace, may get to the place of work, or that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Look at verse 13. In verse 13, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Verse 14, it says, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of knowing of whom thou hast learned them in Jeremiah chapter 12 uh, some of these things we have, you know, we're experiencing uh, they're very very small they're very very minor and they're ordinary uh, she didn't greet me uh-huh and uh, she didn't respect me. Uh -huh. He's not, uh, you know, smiling at me. Uh -huh. They are talking behind me. Uh -huh. All those things are little, little things compared with what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego has gone to ask yourself. What if I were one of those uh, three companions, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Ask yourself, what if I faced a tyrant? furious, angry, like Nebuchadnezzar. All that you are going through, they'll be as nothing. And that's why it says in Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 5, if thou hast run with the footmen, and they have wearied thee. If all these small, small things that are happening, that you call your own persecution, that you call your own cross, that you call your own difficulty, that you call your own trials, if all these small things of run were footmen and they have wearied thee then how canst thou contend with the horses it's saying if you cannot contend with all those small small people when Nebuchadnezzar comes when a tyrant comes and when somebody and maybe comes into your life and you say so all the convictions you have carried since you became a Christian you have to drop each if I'm going to stay with you, if you're going to stay with me, what are you going to do at that time? And if in the land of peace, wherein thou trusted, they weary thee, then how canst thou do in the swelling of Jordan? We're looking at number three here. Number three here, great trials with a great triumph. Look at John chapter 16. We're looking at verse 30. Hear the very words of Jesus. These things have I spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace in the world. Here are the words of Christ. In the world, not everybody will pat you on the back. In the world, not everybody will smile at you. If you're a man of conviction, if you're a woman of conviction, in the world, not everybody will say, yes, madam, yes, sir. In the world, not everybody will show respect. Even the ordinary respect, they show to the man, the woman on the street. Not everybody will do that to you. In the world, it says, ye shall have tribulation, trial, testing, threats, threatenings, and tribulation, but 
be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And because you are connected to Christ and you are so linked to Christ and you will not turn back, you'll overcome the world in Jesus' name. In First Peter chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 6. First Peter chapter 1, verse 6, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, always notice that for a season is not forever, for a season is only in this life for a season only a few years stay there and deal that thing and remain under that pressure and remain under the threatening and the tribulation is for a season don't talk don't say any foolish thing don't abuse don't don't be like the world don't fight back don't retaliate don't revenge just stay there quiet with your heart Offering prayer unto the Lord and praises unto the Lord, your heart adoring God and worshiping God for the grace He gives you. He says, It's for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. In verse 7, it says that the trial of your faith. That the purpose, that the reason, that's what they want to get away from you, your faith. When the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on the earth? The people have been so much under pressure that the things they do to them in the world and the things they threaten them with in the world will suck their faith away and they will not be like they were in the earlier years of their Christian faith. But you want to understand that whatever pressure may be there, it is the trial of your faith being much more precious than the than gold that perishes though it be tried with fire might be found unto the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. It tells us in verse 8, in verse 8 it says, So have you not seen ye love, and in whom do now ye see him not, yet believing ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Verse 9, verse 9 says, Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of of your souls. First Peter chapter 4 verse 12. In verse 12, beloved, think it not strange concerning the fairy trials which is come to try you as though some strange things happened unto you. Already we have been told everyone that will live godly shall suffer persecution. Everyone, everyone. The, the young people, they suffer persecution too in, at school in their communities. The fathers, the mothers, the adults will we all suffer persecution because of what we stand for and how we stand for what we stand for. And so when it comes to you and you too, you are standing for righteousness and you are standing for Christ and you are standing for the word and the will of God. Trials will come. Think it not strange concerning the very trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. Look at verse 13. In verse 13 it says, But rejoice. Many people mama, but rejoice. Many people complain, but rejoice. Many people become afraid. They are timid and they are fearful. This is happening today. I don't know what will happen tomorrow. I'm not enjoying life. I'm not enjoying this. They're complaining. But he said, don't complain, but rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, of Christ's suffering. If you are partaker of his salvation, if you are partaker of his supply, if you are partaker of the provision he has made, he says, we also partake in Christ's suffering when his glory shall be revealed and ye that ye may be glad also with exceeding joy amen in every life we're looking at point number two now point number two we're looking at the coercion of godly companions through the king's domination now a coercion is a pressure 
coercion. Anna is people pushing you. And even when they push you to the wall, they keep on pushing you as if they want to drive you into the wall. Our nature, natural nature, natural climate, natural thing, we don't like coercion. We don't like anybody that talks rough, that acts rough, that pushes us, that doesn't even take care, you're going to injure me. As you, They don't care for that. Coercion is to put pressure on you. It's to make the fire hot so that you will run out. Either you run out of the Christian faith, or you run out of your place of work, or you run out of your ministry, or you run out of your calling, or you run out of your marriage. When the people, whether they are in-laws, whoever they are, when they make the fire very hot, when everybody talks, when they get the heart, the mind of their son, when they get the mind of their daughter, and every, from everywhere they put the pressure on you, that's coercion. And when you face such coercion, if you are kind of a normal, ordinary person, and even the grace of God has not made you extraordinary, and it push you and push you and push you like that, and then you are thinking, why are they doing all this to me? Because you are saved, because of your salvation. And then you say, I cannot bear this anymore. Either you give up the salvation, and you say, if it's for salvation, this is too much. And you lose heaven, and you miss heaven. Or you don't give up uh, salvation directly. You get out of where God has placed you. He's placed you in that ministry. He's placed you in that family. He's placed you in a place of work. And But the fire, the heat is so much. You say, well, if it's because of work, I don't need money. I don't want money. I don't want anything. Then you go out. That's not right. That's where God has put you. Or it is that you say, anywhere I go, everywhere I go, this pressure is too much, coercion. Then you say, I get out of life. When you get out of life, that is the worst. If you take any pill, you take anything, you swallow. And you know, once you take that overdose, you are gone. You go, you think you are escaping from the coercion and the furnace and the fire of Nebuchadnezzar. You are getting to the other fire, hell fire, that will be forever and forever. Whatever happens, whoever coerces you, whatever pressure they give you, and however tired you may be, just stay there. Never take your life and don't go out of the world into eternity because you say this is too much. Coercion should not push us to do anything. Look, we're standing against sin and we're standing against evil and we're standing against the coercion and the pressure of the world and now we allow that coercion to make us commit the greatest of all sins to commit suicide that's murder thou shalt not kill if that happens you have allowed satan to drive you to the point you personally choose okay you are going to hell instead of staying here you will stay I said you will stay and God is faithful that will not allow you to be tempted or tried more than you are able and he will with the trial with the temptation make a way for you that you will escape you'll be set free in Jesus name we're looking at three things here number one we're looking at the accusation against the godly companions before the furious Babylonian Nebuchadnezzar number two the accommodation of a gambling compromise by the fierce blasphemer uh, you know the is okay I will accommodate you I, I know somebody can be foolish and sometimes 
you are foolish in the decision you are taking. I, I will give you another chance. Here is the way to gamble your soul and then to lose your soul. If you will say you are sorry for the righteousness of yesterday, of last week, of last month. You are sorry for the righteousness and the sanctification and the firmness of your past. And now you turn around, play it cool. Look, other Jews are there. You are not the only one that came from the Jewish land, from Judah. Look at those other ones. They are bowing down. So if you reconsider and you have this gamble, this gambling of a compromise, well, but if not, if you are rigid, if you are firm, if you say, here is where you stand, Nebuchadnezzar said, I will show you where I stand. He stood for idolatry. And anyone that will not worship that idol, that fellow will be cast into burning fairy furnace. That's the gambling he wants you, he wants they, he wanted them to get into. You know, when people are talking with you, they may not talk with words, they talk with action. They may not talk with, you know, words, they talk with body language. They may not talk with you with words, they talk with the fury in the face. And they are saying, slow down. They are saying, cool down. They're saying, change your mind. They're saying, gamble and compromise. They're saying, own them as your God and not look to heaven as the only authority over you. They call you to compromise. Compromise is gambling. You're gambling with your soul. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will not. They said, do what you want. You have liberty to build the fire i have that liberty to get into the fire if you push me there but you'll not get me to volunteer to compromise and to lose my soul let's be very careful of compromise is gambling gambling with your soul number three the affirmation of a glorious consecration by the fortified believers. Look at number one. Number one is the accusation against the godly companions before the furious Babylonian. Uh, you, you, you know the story? They came to report them. They said, there are three men in your kingdom. You have even promoted them to be here and there. But they worship not your idol. But let me remind you, Satan is behind all that kind of accusation. Satan wanted them to compromise. If they will not compromise, Satan wanted them to burn in the furry furnace. Hey, look at Revelation chapter 12. And I'm reading from verse 10. Revelation chapter 12. And we're reading from verse 10. It says, And I heard a loud voice saying, in heaven now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of our brethren is cast down the accusers will be cast down I said the accusers will be cast down. The accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accuse them before our God day and night. You should understand the person behind that accusation. I didn't do that. How could they say that about me? check the records i didn't even go after that i wasn't there the person the personality behind that accusation is the devil you will not cry for the devil when they accuse you like that and you didn't even know head or tail about and they say this happened this happened why didn't they see other people why is it only this shit like Meshach and Abednego they were you know following I see they were trailing them don't worry the Lord will bring a great great manifestation of power through the persecution you are going through in Jesus name we're looking at number two. Number two is the accommodation of a gambling company 
compromise by the fierce blasphemer. He had told them, look at that in uh, Daniel chapter 3, reading from verse 14, Nebuchadnezzar speak and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Look at verse 15. In verse 15, now, if ye be ready, if you reconsider, if you think about it again, you are young. If you think about your life and you think of what will happen now, if you don't surrender, if you don't submit, submit your will, take it away from the hand of God and make your will to be under my control. If you don't do that, but you can consider and you can think about it, you, you have a lot ahead of you, your life your happiness don't you want to be happy your joy don't want to be joyful do you want to be under my fury and my fears countenance every time don't you want you want to so you have some relaxation so that you can enjoy your life consider it consider it. all the goals of god all the visions of god all the aspirations you have all the ambition you have if you are rigid like this i'll cut them short i'll cancel them you will not get to that place you want to get to consider age and compromise that's what he was telling them in life that's what happens to us what they threaten us don't you have a goal don't you have an ideal don't you have a destiny? Don't you have something you want to achieve on earth? Don't you want to be happy? Don't you want to have joy? Don't you want to have, uh, you know, health, strength? Do you want to be under this harassment, harassment every time? Consider. That's what they tell us. That's what they will tell you. But the consideration does not take in the factor of God. It does not take in the power of God, the prophecy of the Bible, the promise of the Lord. It does not take on the pleasure of the Lord. What does God want? What does God desire? And what does God demand? It doesn't take that, only that you think of yourself, the self-centeredness. And it's depravity that makes us to think only of my joy. I want to be happy. I want to be joyful. I want to be successful. I want to be this. And if I don't compromise with them, then I lose all that. That's depravity. You are self, you are self centered. But if you say, my hand, my destiny, anything I have, anything I will have, is in the hand of God. If they think they can make you unhappy, let them go ahead. If they think they can cut short your life let them go ahead but you've made up your mind you're going to serve God and nothing will take that decision consecration away from you in Jesus name and so he wanted them to compromise then he said in the middle of the verse he said but if ye worship not Ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of the burning furry furnace. And who is that God? Their language sometimes will make believers afraid. They're so sure of themselves. This is what they can do. They can torture your life. They can torment your life. And they can make you miserable here on earth. And they say, okay, go ahead. You're a prayer warrior. You can pray. Go and pray. You depend on the promises of God. Oh, yes. Go and call the promises of God. You can fast. You can pray. And come out of this. Go and fast. Whatever number of days you want to fast, but we we'll tell you, if you don't compromise, we'll finish your life. And that's why people fear, and that's why they cannot go ahead with their conviction. But they can do nothing. I want to hear a good amen. Nebuchadnezzar himself said later in chapter 4, they that walk in pride, God is able to abase. Look at the story of that man. The Lord abased him. 
even to the point of being like an animal to each grass a shadrach meshach and abednego they were still alive you will be alive yeah. all those threats they mean nothing they, they're serious but let them go ahead and do it god has the final say in your life and so he said who is that god that can deliver you out of my hands what if they compromised what if they said this is going too far let's stop this scenario it will mean that they compromise to lose their lives in mark chapter 8 mark chapter 8 i'm reading from verse 36 for what shall he profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul if you compromise if you agree with nebuchadnezzar if you bend to his image if you become an idol worshiper and then you lose your soul what have you gained whatever you gained by the compromise for all eternity you regret in verse 37 verse 37 or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul it tells us in proverbs chapter 29 verse 25 it says the fear of man bringeth a snare the fear of Nebuchadnezzar, the fear of Pharaoh, the fear of Herod, the fear of that man, the fear of that woman, the fear of conspiracy, the fear of suffering. All that fear brings us near. But whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be saved. Luke chapter 12, we're looking at verse 4. But I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body. Like Nebuchadnezzar, that's all he could do. He could throw the body into the fire. And after that, have no more that they can do. Verse 5, in verse 5, but I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him. These are the words of Jesus fear him which after he has killed has power to cast into hell yea I say unto you fear him we're coming to number three here number three it's the affirmation of a glorious consecration by the fortified believers we're looking at daniel chapter 3 and we're reading from verse 16 shadrach meshach and abednego answered and said to the king O nebuchadnezzar were not careful to answer thee in this matter they didn't say O king exalted king flattering him believers should come back to the real faith that we don't uh, flatter the people that in our hearts we know that in us Nebuchadnezzar he doesn't love God he doesn't accept her conviction serving God and it doesn't go the way of the Lord we know that and then we flatter them or somebody gets into a position we know is that fellow that fellow could do something that could destabilize somebody's life and then we write a letter of you know congratulation and solidarity and this and that's you don't believe that in your heart that's hypocrisy don't allow the fear of man or the things that people might do and because you are eager to protect your life by yourself and not thinking of God and God alone you're flattering them you are sending this and sending that unto them no Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego answered and said to the king O Nebuchadnezzar were not careful to answer thee in this matter look at verse 17 if it be so we know that you are not under any control you are not on any law you, you don't listen to anybody we can't talk to you nobody can talk to you but all the same go ahead if it be so our god whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning furry furnace 
I want you to remember that this had never happened to anybody. This kind of trial, this kind of threatening had never happened to anybody. I want you to, I want you to know that this kind of situation had never arisen any time in history that a king will threaten people like this, even if it never happened to anybody before. And you are the first one. God will make you an example of the manifestation of a miracle. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, furry furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. But what if not? How do you respond to that? He will deliver us. But we don't know his plan. We don't know what he's going to do. What if he does otherwise? Verse 18. In verse 18. But if not, if all the prayer, God does not answer it in that direction. He answers it in this other direction. What if all the trusting and all the claiming of the promises, what if God does not answer it in this way to take away and to quench the fire? What if the fire keeps on burning? What are we going to do? All the same. Our faith, our trust is not in the, you know, suggestion that when we get to that fire, that fire will be quenched. That fire will go on and the fire will not burn at all. It may be the other way. God can preserve you inside that fire. Any fire that any man, any woman, any group of people, any fire that they make, God can preserve you. If you have been praying, God, quench the fire, remove the fire, put up the fire, whatever, uh, dampen the fire. If God doesn't answer that way, does that mean we're going to succumb? We're going to compromise? We're going to say, I thought it would happen this way. Since it did happen that way, now I compromise never. Well, we're not compromise you will not compromise. If you are born again, you leave the result in the hand of the Lord. But if not, be it known unto thee, O King, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. May God give every one of us that kind of fortified mind, courage, and determination, diligence, in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number three now. Point number three, the comportment and gracious composure despite the king's deadliness. We've read the passage already. We're looking at three points here. Three things. Number one, the calm courage of faith under fire. The calm courage of faith under fire. Courage does not tremble. Courage does not have the heart palpitating. Courage does not make a person looking up and there and looking for contact, somebody to contact and to talk to and Nebuchadnezzar so that this will not happen. When it comes persecution, when it comes threats, when it comes the trial, you remain calm. If you have faith in the Lord, if you have left everything in the hands of God, that's God's business. That's what God will deal with. That's something for God to look into. My hand is not there. My mind is not there. And I can go to sleep. Like when Peter went to sleep, the previous day to the point Herod was to execute him. It wasn't, it didn't bother him. He just kept calm. And that's what the Lord wants us to have. When you have courage in the Lord, when you have faith in the Lord, you are calm and you leave the result in the hands of the Lord. You have calm courage of faith under fire. Number two, is the constant conviction. You can examine your conviction. Did I do wrong? Was that all right? Should I have worshipped idol? No. 
Was it wrong to worship idol? Yes, it was wrong. My conviction is God alone is who I should serve. You cannot serve God and man, God and monarch, God and mammon. You have to serve God and God alone. You shouldn't be so gentle and so humble that you surrender your soul into the hand of any monarch, any man, anyone. And so they kept their conviction constant and they were fearless despite his fury. Number three, the clear consecration and faithfulness to the faithful. He is the faithful. And if we're serving him, he deserves our faithfulness to the faithful, in the faithful one. He's never disappointed us. Why should we disappoint him? He's never failed us. Why should we fail him? And he has never rejected us and abandoned us in difficulty. Why should we now cringe and crawl and then be coward and conquered by Nebuchadnezzar, the blasphemer of all people. Look at number one. Number one, there come courage of faith under fire. In Daniel chapter 3, verse 16, verse 17, it says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said, when somebody is afraid, you can see fear in that in their tone. When somebody is timid, you can see that timidity in their tone. And when somebody is frightened, you can, you can feel that uh, frightening in uh, their voice. But here, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, with their normal voice, with calmness, with coolness, without being afraid of anything or anyone, they said to the king of Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful, we are not fearful, we are not frightened, we're not fretting, we're not afraid to answer thee in this matter. It says in verse 17, if it be so, our God, not your God, our God, our God was saved, our God was sanctified, and we have consecrated, committed our lives into the hands of the Lord, our God whom we serve, our God is able, what can he not do? He opened the Red Sea, he is able, he brought down the walls of Jericho, is able, he sank Pharaoh and all his chariots in the sea, is able, he defeated Goliath, bragging that he'll destroy the whole of Israel with a little stone. What can not our God do? He is able to deliver us from the burning furry furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. He will deliver you. All those things that are, you know, roaming or roaring or whatever. It's just, you know, the action of man. That's man. That's man. He knows, knows uh, he has his uh, breath. But God can send an angel and destroy 185,000 soldiers of the Assyrian Empire in one night. If God can do that, God will conquer for you. And God will set you totally free from all those things that are trying to bring fear into your life in Jesus' name. In Philippians chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 6. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, it says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Then in verse 7, in verse 7, and the, and the peace of God. God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and mind through Jesus Christ. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Look at number two there. Number two, it says, is their constant conviction and fearlessness despite fury. 
their constant conviction. You must have a conviction. Before the trial comes, have a conviction. Before the temptation comes, have conviction. This is what I will do, and this is what I will not do. This is how far I will go. This is how far I will not go. This is what I will uh, handle with that man. If it goes beyond that, no. This is how far I will go with my unbelieving relatives. If it goes beyond that, I will not. You must have that conviction before the trial, before their fury, and before all those things come to you. Their constant conviction and fearlessness despite Fury. We've read already about. Uh, let's okay. Let's look at it in Daniel chapter three, verse seventeen. If it be so, our God, <clears throat> whom we serve, is able to deliver us from uh, the burning fiery furnace, and He will deliver us out of thine hand, uh, O King. Before you go out in the morning. To meet all the challenges of life before you face anyone, a man, a woman, in life, before you go out, settle in your mind, what can your God do? What can your God do? Because if you don't know what God can do, you and you don't know he is able, are you going to be able to endure? We're looking at Ephesians chapter 3 verse 19. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 19. Ephesians 3 19. And to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. When you are filled with the fullness of God, you will not tremble before any mortal man, no matter what he has, what he does, or what he can do. Because we are told in verse 20, in verse 20 it says now, unto him that is able, able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us settle that at home before you go out don't avoid any appointment you have because that person is going to be there never don't avoid anybody you have to face because I know his mind, I know his stature. Fear will rule your life and you'll not be able to achieve everything you ought to achieve. Don't avoid any challenge, any difficulty, any discomfort. Go understanding there is a power that worketh in you and God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. If you're going to continue being afraid, why did you pray? If you're going to continue being worried, why did you pray? If you're going to continue being anxious, why did you pray? If you're going to continue like a jellyfish, no backbone, and you're afraid of everything and everyone, if you're going to be avoiding what God has called you to do, why did you pray? But once you pray, you understand, my God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that I ask or seek according to the power that walketh in me. Look at verse 21. And then it says unto him, be glory in the church. Not unto Nebuchadnezzar, be glory. is a man of power. is a man of, you know, a great empire. Unto God alone, who is able to deliver us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Look at number three here. Number three, we're looking at their clear consecration and faithfulness 
show the faithful is a faithful God because he's faithful to all the prophecies that had been uh, spoken in the word of God is faithful to all the promises that he has given is faithful to all his people all his people he has assured them that this is what he will do for them and world without end all ages all throughout until we get to eternity everything he has said everything he has promised everything he has ordained everything will be done and Nebuchadnezzar will not change the promises of God Nebuchadnezzar will not change the prophecy of the word Nebuchadnezzar will not change the favor is going to have on the people of God that's why you know you have your consecration by the way make your consecrations before you meet your the powerful people of the world the tyrants of the world the tempters of the world you see the problem is if you don't make your consecration and know that here is where you stand and this is where you are going to stand before you meet those people your prayers your commitment your vision and everything will be dependent on their personality because you are so much afraid of them let those consecrations be settled that this is what I will be in Christ, what I will do in Christ, and the way I will take my stand. When that is done, then you have faithfulness to the faithful. It tells us in Daniel chapter 3, verse 18, they said, But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. And look at First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. It says, There's no temptation taking you, but such as is common to all man. But God is faithful, who will not permit you, suffer you, allow you, and throw you into the hands of the tempter. He says he will not suffer you to be tempted more than ye above that ye are able. But will, with the temptation, also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Able to bear it. I said able to bear it, able to bear it, it will make a way and you'll come out without the fire of Nebuchadnezzar having any effect on you in Jesus' name. You'll come out without the persecution, the trial, changing your personality, changing your stand, changing your commitment changing everything you have told the lord i'm born again i'm a child of god this is the way i will live unto the lord in total complete unreserved faithfulness to you all the days of my life and then in verse 14 it says in verse 14 wherefore my dearly beloved flee from idolatry you know whatever threats come those idolaters will not be able to hurt you therefore flee from idolatry we're looking at second timothy chapter 4 and we're reading from verse 18 second timothy chapter 4 reading from verse 18 and the lord shall deliver me from every evil work that's all the amen you have the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Now, all the other Jews in Babylon, apart from Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who bowed to the idol, who cringed before the fearsome, fearful uh, Nebuchadnezzar. The question is, where are they today? All the people that changed their conviction, 
when they were in Jerusalem, Judea, they were not worshipping any idol. They had been carried to captivity in Babylon. And then the threats and the trial and the pressure and the domination of Nebuchadnezzar made them to succumb and to surrender. If they didn't repent from that, where are they today? That's the question. But we know where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we know where they are today. They're in heaven. Well, they were the king of kings and the lord of lords because the lord delivered them literally that day that time the lord delivered them out of the bony furry furnace and now they've gone to heaven the lord has delivered them from the eternal lake of fire they are now in heaven we make a choice what we want to spend eternity and we don't allow anything of today anything of the present time to make us bend and bow to the idols of the world ideologies of the world the pressures of the world but to stand for God so that when our day will come when our time will come we'll get to heaven in Jesus name and the Lord will deliver you from every evil work and the Lord will preserve you unto his heavenly kingdom and to our God to our Lord to our Savior to our Redeemer the glory both now and forevermore in Jesus' name. Let's rise up now and take everything we've learned to the Lord in prayer. The Lord has taught us today and has reminded us how our lives ought to be, what conviction we ought to have, what courage we ought to have, what kind of life we ought to have. Tell the Lord he gave Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego grace and strength will give you sufficient grace that you'll go through till the end of life. You'll not spend eternity away from God. You'll spend eternity in heaven in Jesus' name. Is